Welcome, investigator. Evil is on the rise. Crime is escalating. Our mission is to eliminate the crime by exposing evil, examine why it manifests, and highlight the brave souls that confront it every day. Join us as we work together to bring justice to every victim. Welcome to All Things Crime. Here's your host, Jared Bradley. Hey guys, it's Jared, your host with All Things Crime. First of all, I just want to thank you for joining us. And while we're here, why don't you hit the subscribe button and that little bell so you never miss an episode. Man, it's uh, it's been quite the adventure and the journey with Detective Lindsay Wade from the Tacoma Police Department. She has been just an absolute fantastic guest. And we are now on episode five, which is the last of this series. And uh, if you have enjoyed this uh, nearly as much as I have, I hope that you will follow Detective Wade on LinkedIn and other areas. Uh, she's got a book coming out, and it's just really exciting stuff. So, again, I want to thank her as a guest. Thank you for listening or watching this on, on YouTube or whatever platform you're on. And hope you enjoy episode five. Here we go. The relationship and the case and everything. I mean, it was, it was a once, you know, once in a lifetime for me. You know, I will say that the thing that I didn't expect uh, or didn't anticipate um, was how difficult it was going to be on the family to solve the case. I mean, you know, in my mind, I'm like thinking from the law enforcement perspective, like, yay, we solved it. But, you know, for the family, and this is really something to keep in mind for investigators is, yeah, you solved it, but you just ripped off a scab on a festering wound that's been festering for 30 years and it's all back they're back in 1986 now so while it's a happy and you know somewhat joyous occasion keep in mind that they are going to be struggling with all of this coming back and bubbling back up to the surface again and so you better have some resources available whether that's a victim advocate, whether that's yourself, whether you're going to be, you know, there for them, you better have a plan in place because it's going to happen. Well, and that's, that's one of those things that I've, I've heard from multiple detectives that have said, you know, there, there is no such thing as moving on. No, you know, the, the victim's families never truly heal, you know, especially no, because I, I of mean, the, how could you? yeah, right. And the injustice of it, where, you know, you have this beautiful little girl who is just at the, the start of her life. And all of a sudden, not only is, is she taken away from her family, but all of the, and I'm sure the family looks at it like her mom knew her potential. Her mom knew what this little girl was, was uh, capable of. And so she's looking at her saying, not only did you take away my daughter, but you took away my daughter's future and all of the amazing things that she could have accomplished in her life. And you stole that from all of us. And so there, there's, there's all of those things that contribute to it. You know, for the, for the criminal, a lot of them, they're just like, well, you know, I just, it was just a spur of the moment thing. And I just, for whatever reason, it's never a good reason, but to them, a lot of it doesn't even require any, uh, or it never even had any forethought to it. It was just kind of right. like a spur of the moment. Oh yeah. You know, I, I, I needed to get off or whatever. And then all of a sudden they realize what they did and they're like, Oh, well, I got to kill this girl now. Mm -hmm. And so they do. And, it, and it's to them, it's like, and then they move on. And like you said, you know, this guy then moved to Illinois and was probably leading a normal life and probably had a wife and kids and was just had totally forgotten about it. And yet for, you know, the victim's family, it, it, that lingers forever. Right. And to me, it's the, the fact that anybody would ever put a criminal's rights. And I, I mean, they have rights, don't get me wrong, but uh, to ever put their, position in favor of a victim's family to me is just absolutely wrong. Yeah. And the really fascinating thing about 
this guy, uh, Robert Washburn, is that the only reason I had his name is because he inserted himself into the investigation by calling in the tip on the other case. And so, you know, when you really break that down and think about it, it's pretty sinister. He called in a tip in May of 1986 and claimed that he saw someone who matched the description of a sketch that was put on the news for the other case that occurred uh, four and a half months you know, before Jennifer was murdered in, in March of uh, 1986 at a different park. But he said that he saw this guy at Point Defiance Park where um, he had been jogging. So he goes as far as to say, uh, you know, gives a description of the guy, says he looks like the sketch. And then, so that's May. So let's, so just as a timeline goes, the Michelle Welch was murdered on uh, March 31st, 1986. Washburn calls in a tip about her murder in May of 1986 and says that he saw a man who looked like the sketch in her case jogging at Point Defiance Park, which is not the park where she was murdered, but it's the park that Jennifer will later be murdered at in, in August of 1986. So in, in, in almost the exact same way. Yes. So May, he calls in that tip. And then August 4th of 1986, Jennifer is abducted and murdered in Point Defiance Park. He was interviewed by detectives they had reached out to him multiple times and he never called back, wasn't home when they went by. Eventually in, I think it was December of 86, the detectives finally reached him and interviewed him at his house. And he gave the same account. Now, so, so now he's already murdered Jennifer, but they interview him about his tip that he calls in on the suspect. You know, he gives the same account that he gave to the 911 dispatcher. He even goes to fa- so far as to say, yeah, I, you know, I jog at Point Defiance Park sometimes twice a day, and um, he didn't live too far from the park. And if I happen to see this guy again, I'll, you know, I'll call it in. So he had one one arrest uh, for, I think it was like like vehicle prowling and trespassing um, in King County, which is the county north of us, uh, in 1985. So that was his only criminal history. So the detectives, they didn't really think anything of him. Um, he's listed in the case as an other. He's not even listed as a suspect or anything like that. Just somebody that they contacted and interviewed because he called in a tip. And that's why his name was in the case file. But wow. it begs the question, why did he call in that tip? Why did he call in a tip about Michelle's case? And then, you know, a couple months later, murder Jennifer in the same park that he called this tip in. You know, was he fixated or fascinated by Michelle's case? Did that case motivate him to commit the crime? Was, you know, we don't know because he never, he didn't give an interview. The only thing he said when he was arrested was, you know, how did I go from being a witness to being a suspect? And he said that, you know, when he was told that his DNA was matched uh, to evidence from the crime scene, he said that his DNA was all over the park, which was frightening. Yeah, that's that's all he said. So he's never actually described how he did it. No. Mm-hmm. Um, he did make some statements in jail and his jail uh, cellmate came forward and and reported some statements that he had made. But, you know, he's never um, just come out and talked freely about what he actually did. So. He was convicted and sentenced to what? He, so he pled guilty and he was sentenced to 26 and a half years, I think, which was the maximum based on the sentencing guidelines in 1986. He was charged with murder one, I believe. Um, and there was no sexual component because Jennifer was um, not found for 24 days. So she was pretty bad in pretty bad shape when she was found. And, you know, while it was her body positioning and the position of her clothing would indicate she was sexually assaulted, along with the semen that was later found in her swimsuit, there was no definitive evidence of sexual assault by the medical examiner. So there um, there was no sexual assault or rape charge. 
So, so he was con- he was convicted before they got the the DNA off the swimsuit. No, after after. Mm. But just because there's DNA on the swimsuit, that doesn't prove rape. So right. he yeah, that um, makes sense. Yeah. So he's. I mean, I think he was in his late fifties, early sixties when he was uh, convicted. So I, I, I mean, I assume he's going to die in prison. And he's in Washington state prisons. Mm-hmm. Hmm. You know, the sad thing is, uh, again, you compare, uh, the life that Jennifer could have had versus the life that this guy did have. And, you know, he had almost 30 years free to yeah. live, to live his life when, um, he should have been in prison. Mm-hmm. but at least he is. So yeah. I mean, uh, to me, it, there's a lot of cases like this where I, I look at it and I say, you know, at least eventually, well, there's two things actually, eventually detectives like you will knock on their door and you know, the, the diligence and the persistence and just the dogged uh, determination of a lot of our law enforcement to me is just, astounding and you guys you know again you're motivated because you have a relationship with the victim's family and so it inspires you to get up every day and continue to do it despite the stress and and the the taxing nature of your job most people don't understand that yeah and psychologists have looked at law enforcement and it's between 3 and 600 times higher stress levels than what most normal people go through. Mm -hmm. And you, you start adding that to not only the dangers of the job, but the stresses of your job. And I'll tell you, if you, if you just go around the street and you asked a thousand people, how many of you would actually be willing and, or, or what, how much money would we have to pay you to go into somebody's living room and sit down with a grieving mother and say, yeah, we haven't been able to solve your case yet or, or to actually say, you know, your daughter's, we found your daughter and she's deceased. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't know how much money you would have to pay some normal person, but it would be a huge amount. And most people would just say, I don't don't care how much you pay me. I'd never do it. And yet that's all part of the job for you guys. Yep. And, you know, and anybody that's not appreciative of, uh, our, our law enforcement being willing to do that and being willing to, you know, work all night long and deal with the, uh, let's see, how do you describe the <laughs> portion of society that is out in the middle of the night, uh, doing things that are criminal. <laughs> yeah. So, people that are up to no good. <laughs> yeah. And you know, anybody that's up at 3 AM, um, you know, some of them are going to work, but most of them aren't. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's when most of the law enforcement has to happen. And, you know, we don't see a lot of that. The sheer fact that we have law enforcement officers out there that are willing to do what you guys do on a daily basis for 20 some years, and then to keep us safe so that society as a whole will function. And then right. we'll actually be able to do what we do. You know, I know you're retired now, and so you're doing, uh, you know, other, other things. Well, you wouldn't be able to do that if there wasn't still law enforcement out on the street, you know, keeping in the society as a whole yeah. uh, functioning. And, and it's, you know, a lot of a lot of these folks that are, you know, defund the police and, you know, we don't need law enforcement. And you're like, you're out of your mind. Mm-hmm. You have no idea how crazy society and how fast society would break down if we didn't have an active law enforcement out on the streets every single day. When you think about the, you know, two years ago, it's interesting that we had this, uh, you know, the pandemic anniversary, you know, was uh, like two, two days ago, I think, Mm -hmm. where you think of the craziness that started happening once people started getting locked down. And I don't know, I, to this day, I still don't know why the run on toilet paper happened, but yeah, yeah, you know, that, but that in general, you, you know, you look at that specific example right there, think about the lawlessness and the, how fast society broke down when they, for some re- odd reason, which 
still, I don't think anybody really understands. But for some reason, the rumor got out that you needed a 15 year supply of toilet paper. And people were willing to like get into fist fights in Costco, mm -hmm. you know, and how fast society broke down over toilet paper. Right. And, you know, and hand sanitizer. Then you start thinking, well, if that, it, it, and, and every, every year at Christmas, hap, the same kind of thing happens where people are, you know, in fist fights over a TV or, or a, a cabbage patch doll. And then you think about, okay, that's with our law enforcement on the streets. Now imagine if people knew in the back of their minds, there's nobody that's going to catch me. And unless this homeowner uh, is physically able to stop me, I can go into any home I want and do anything I want and nothing's going to happen to me. Yeah. Yeah. Society without law enforcement would break down so fast it, it, and it would get just so crazy in, in a matter of days our entire society would cease to function. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and that's, that's why anybody that says, you know, they, they don't really, they don't like cops and, you know, they got pulled over one time when there was no justification of it and their, their vehicle got searched. And, and I'm like, wow, you know what? <laughs> it's it's yeah. sometimes that happens. And sometimes, you know, you happen to fit the description of what, uh, what, you know, they're looking for a, a, uh, somebody they're looking for a, a murder suspect and you happen to fit some of the description of it. And so they had to go through this exercise and, you know, pull you over and search your vehicle. It's like, that's a pretty minor price to pay in order for, you know, to live in a society where it actually functions and you can go to work every day and, and you can go shopping without, uh, for the most part, I mean, you can go shopping and not worry about getting, robbed or assaulted or, or worse. And mm -hmm. that is all because of, of law enforcement. And, yeah. you know, some people, they just think, oh, the wild, wild west would just never happen. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, I think you are a little mistaken on that one. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, yeah, Lindsay, what a fantastic discussion. And I, uh, wow. I, you know, I've been trying to, um, get more folks like you on the show, because some of the things that you describe are just so amazing. And I, I love the fact that, you know, you're willing to actually share those experiences because I, I, the whole reason for this show is to explore not just cases itself, but actually the people that do it and uh, the process that you guys have to go through in order to, to solve a case. Because the CSI effect is real. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how, how many times you've had to explain uh, why it took you 30 years to, to solve, you know, that particular case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's kind of funny because we did a Dateline episode uh, on this case and the producer immediately when it came out, she's like, don't read the comments. And I'm like, why? She goes, just believe me. She goes, people, you know, there's just a lot of trolls out there and people will just say really, stupid things. And of course, you know, I can't help myself after read the comments. <laughs> and, you know, one of the first comments on there was like, well, duh, like, like, of course it was him. Like, I can't believe it took that long. How, you know, how stupid or something like that. And I was like, okay, this is clearly coming from someone that has no idea what they're talking about, but good for you. I'm glad you like to watch true crime as a hobby. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's, there's a whole element out there that you know, are the armchair detectives and it, you know, they're the same with the armchair quarterbacks that yeah. the day after the game, they're all like, well, you know, Tom Brady should have done this. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, you know, if you actually had put in the time and put in the exercise and developed his talent, then maybe you could have been there instead of, instead of Tom Brady. But yeah, the fact that you're not means that you didn't. Well, right. and, and the same is true for detectives. I mean, I, I, I have a certain expertise and obviously with the MVAC and DNA and stuff, I, I have, you know, a small piece to play in, in solving crimes, but compared to all of the time and effort and the trainings that you have done in, in order to develop the skill set 
necessary to solve a case like this, you know, there's no comparison. You start looking at people that are willing to, you know, be internet trolls on, mm-hmm. on solving a case. That's <laughs> just, I, I look at that. I, you know, and I, I think initially, and it, I, I'm not sure what your reaction was, but other than, yeah, this, this guy is really clueless. But sometimes it, like people get mad, but ultimately I think we just kind of laugh and are just like, you yeah, know what? Um, I mean, there, yeah, I mean, that's all you really can do is laugh because it's like you, you have no concept of what you're talking about, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and you know, being clueless is fine. Just, but being an appreciative clueless. Yeah, exactly. So, um, well, I do have a book coming out. Um, oh, fantastic. What, what's, uh-huh. Yeah. I'm Tell hoping by, by summer it'll be out, but it's a true crime memoir. And uh, the book covers a selection of cases that I investigated over my career, um, including Jennifer's case. So yeah, maybe after the book comes out or as it's coming out, I can come back on and, and chat about the book. Oh, I'd love that. Absolutely. Let's, let's, uh, yeah, you tell me when it's going to be out and we'll promote the heck out of that thing. That's got to be a great book. It's kind of like, you know, Cloyd put out a couple of books and those are just amazing. Yeah. So I'm sure yours, your book will be just as good. Well, yeah, let's, uh, it's been a long time, long time in the process. It's, it's, it's been a journey, um, writing it, rewriting it, rewriting it, rewriting it and, um, getting it to where it's at now. But yeah, the hope is that we'll be putting it out by summer. Oh, fantastic. Now what's the name of it again? We don't have, uh, for sure. But uh, we don't know what the title is for sure. But I think the working title right now is in my DNA, uh, my career investigating your worst nightmares. Very cool. Well, congratulations. That's fantastic. Yeah. No, I, I, I've, I've started a book about four times. And I think I've gotten about two pages of the first <laughs> chapter written. And I was yeah. just like, Oh, forget this. Yeah. <laughs> so it's- anybody that's willing to actually go through that entire process. Oh, good for you. Well, thank you. And thanks uh, again for having me on the show. Fun chatting about cases and um, all things related to cold cases, especially. <laughs> yeah, no, I have. To, oh, fantastic. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And I am going to be uh, getting to work on this right away. So you have a great day and appreciate you spending the time. And um, yeah, keep, um, keep safe out there. Great. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Your attention today brings us one step closer to exposing and eliminating the evil that brings crime to our communities. Hit subscribe and share this episode. Together, we will bring justice to every victim.